worship you, Jesus. We glorify your name tonight, Jesus. How do you know that he's made a way when there was no way? Hallelujah. He is faithful. He is good. Hallelujah. Let's worship him. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, there is no one like you, Jesus.
for the Lord your God will go with you wherever you shall go. I don't know who needs to hear this tonight, but he has not left you. He will never forsake you. He goes behind, beside you, behind you. He surrounds you. Oh, yes, Lord. I know you will make a way.
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We want to welcome everyone, praise God, to Impart Conference. Hallelujah. How many are glad to be here tonight? How many know now that you made the right decision to be here tonight? Amen. 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 The Lord knew who would be here tonight. This is our first Impart Conference. Amen. And as I invited you during the week, I have a little saying. The Lord put this in our hearts, and these young men began to plan this conference out. That this conference is not for the crowd. This conference is for the called. There's a lot of conferences with a lot of people, praise God. And God bless those conferences, hallelujah. But you that are in this conference today, hallelujah, you've come with a purpose. And God has met you with his tonight, hallelujah. And we put both of these together. Can you imagine what is about to happen this night? I said, come on, can you imagine what is about to happen this night? Hallelujah. So I challenge you, uh, hold nothing back tonight. Amen. Amen. When they invite me to, and then my, my director's here, I'm going to give him a word here just shortly, but when they invite us to, to, to teach or preach to ministers and, and pastors, and, and I walk into the room and they're singing, I'm just like, Wow. Now, there's someone that don't need to be motivated, do not need to be encouraged. The moment that you walk through these doors is those that have a calling. They know they have a calling. There should be nothing that can hold you back from magnifying and glorifying the Lord. Even before the first, hallelujah, piano tune goes off, hallelujah. There's someone that is called here uh, that knows how to worship and magnify and glorify, hallelujah, their Lord, hallelujah. So let's take a couple of seconds. Come on. Let me see you that are called uh, and you've come to worship, uh, to magnify, uh, to come on now, hallelujah. Where are you at? Where are you at? Hallelujah. You don't need to be motivated. Something is going to happen tonight. Something is going to happen tonight. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Esta conferencia es para ministerios jóvenes. This conference is for young ministries, not just young ministers or young called people. It's for those of any age that is aspire ministry or you're starting your ministry, whether you're young, mid-age, whenever the Lord has called you. And we have seasoned established ministries here tonight that are going to impart into your ministry. That's why this conference is called Impart. Amen. Amen. So we welcome you of all ages to this Young Ministries Conference. Hallelujah. Welcome to Impart. God bless you tonight. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. The house is full. Praise God. Praise the wonderful name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We are so grateful for the men of God that are here. Pastors that have joined us. Los pastores que están aquí. Dios los bendiga. Es un placer, un tremendo privilegio que nos acompañen esta noche. En compartir esto con muchos pastores. Pastor, necesitamos esta conferencia. 
in sharing this vision with several pastors. They've said, Pastor, we need this conference. We need to build up young men and women for ministry. Amen. There's a lot of conferences out there. But when you come to this conference, we want you to go home. Amen. Filled, perhaps with a clear vision of what God wants you to do. And I shared this with Brother Burnett a few months ago. Me, my wife, his wife, we went to dinner. And I thank the Lord for this man of God. He is a young minister. Amen. He's younger than I am. Praise God. But I see him as my leader. I love him. I respect him. He knows that. Amen. Uh, God has put him in my life to open many, many doors. You need to understand, you want your ministry to grow and to have doors open, your pastor's going to do that for you. Your pastor's going to open doors for you. Amen. And I thank the Lord for my pastor. And in fact, he called me on yesterday and we talked and told them what was going on. And, and he was very happy to hear that. And I need these men in my life, amen, uh, to open doors, amen, for the honor and the glory of God and for his kingdom. And Brother Burnett is a good friend of ours. He pastors in the city of Bel Air, Texas, amen. And he is also our Spanish ministries director. And I said, you need to come. Amen. I invite you to come and to greet our conference. So with the hand praise of the Lord, can we receive our Spanish director, Brother John Burnett. Amen. In Jesus' name. Dile ese aplauso al Rey de Reyes y Señor de Señores. Te alabamos. We exalt you, Lord. What a beautiful spirit. Qué hermoso espíritu se siente en este lugar. Prepárese, hermano. Prepare yourself for the impartation of the word. Para la impartación de la palabra. Estaba pensando hace unos momentos atrás. I was thinking you may be seated. Estaba pensando hace unos momentos atrás. I was thinking some minutes ago. And I, I, I just started thinking of the valley. Comencé a pensar del valle. The, the valley of dry bones. El valle de huesos secos. Pero el profeta se paró. The prophet stood up. I mean, and, and in the natural eyes, they, they would have just seen dry bones, dry in great manner. Hubieran visto solamente huesos secos en gran manera. Pero mi hermano, la palabra dice profetiza, prophesy upon those dry bones. Y, y oiganme bien, y cuando él profetizó sobre esos huesos secos, after he prophesied, now he saw a great army. Ahora vio un gran ejército. I don't know, my brothers, but I'm, I'm seeing an army here. Yo, yo veo un ejército. Amén. Gente joven. Algunos más adultos. Some young, some a little older. But I see an army. An army for the kingdom. An army for the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's an honor to be here with you. With the Torres family. I mean, I, I love and appreciate very much. Amo la familia Torres mucho. I mean, un honor conocer a brother Doug White. I mean, an honor to meet him, his son, and his family. I mean, and to be with the leadership of Christian Life. I mean, Dios me le bendiga. God bless you all. And we're going to enjoy today the word of God. I'm going to receive it today. Hallelujah. I'm going to be blessed. How many can say that? Dígalo. Say it in faith. I am going to be. Something is going to take place. Algo va a suceder en mi vida. I'm, I'm going to receive it. Hallelujah. I, I'm going to come out of here encouraged, full of fire and an anointing. A fresh anointing in this hour in Jesus' name. Praise God. Another hand. Praise God. Bless our director, Brother Burnett. His family. Hallelujah. His vision for our. Spanish ministries, amen, Dios bendiga, amen, very quickly, ask the ministry to please stand, amen, look at the support we have from our local ministers, amen, God bless you, men of God, gracias, Dios los bendiga, thank you so much, amen, thank you, you may be seated, I tell the young ministers, you respect them, you hear them, you listen to them, Amen. And God's going to bless your ministry. Amen. And these men are opening the way so that their ministries can come forth. Amen. And those of you that your pastors are here, 
your ministers are here. Always respect them, love them, and watch the Lord, amen, do what he's going to do with your calling. Well, this man of God that is about to take this pulpit, he's got a fan base here at Christian Life and Family Center. Amen. I have been watching him from a distance. He is a spiritual giant. He is an awesome mentor to many, many men of God. And when we started to put this conference together, uh, there's a lot of renowned names out there. Big time evangelists. Amen. But I told the committee, I told Brother Ivan, Brother Isaiah, and their committee, we need to get the man that has proven his ministry to raise up men of God. Amen. And as we begin to look for names, amen, Brother Doug White, amen, his name came up. Amen. You see, he's not known like many are known to be, you know, those ministries that make you jump, shout, and, but he does that too. You just don't know him yet. But it's because God has called him to do a certain work for the kingdom. And we're so honored that he's with us tonight in Jesus' name. Open your heart. Open your heart. You do not want to miss tomorrow. Because his son will be ministering tomorrow, Brother Nathaniel White. Thank you for being here tonight also. God bless his son, amen, that will be ministering on tomorrow, amen. And they have a lot to share with us. Amen. So without further ado, would you please stand? Amen. There's going to be another song, and Brother, Brother White will take this place after the song. But Brother Bishop White, it says, husband to Pam. Or Pam wife to him. I don't know which way it goes. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but Pam is her husband. And I like this a lot. Amen. He's a father. He's a father-in-law. And this almost made me cry. And a grand buddy to three. I like that little saying. Praise God. I got my grandson. Amen. He evangelized for eight years before going to Silsby, Texas pastor of Abundant Life Church for 33 years. My goodness. He shared something the day. He says, Pastor, when somebody, a pastor loses a member, especially the first one you baptized, like we lost one of the first members from our church just a month ago, they will never understand what a pastor feels. 33 years been in full time ministry for 41 years he has authored six of uh, six books of which we are going through amen it's been a blessing to our young ministerial team and we are, are anxious to get through the other four books in Jesus name amen we challenge you to read them so he will come after this song I want you to open your heart would you raise your hands to him right now he needs amen uh, no one to pray for him because I'm sure he has come ready but we just want to say God use his word to bless my life use his mouth God amen to bless my life to bless my ministry to challenge my ministry tonight in the mighty name of Jesus uh, in the mighty name of Jesus
like to call a young lady, a young lady tonight that is willing to stand firm in the word of God, a young lady that is willing to not stay silent in a time where the world needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ the most. Is there an Esther here in this place tonight that can say, God, I'm ready, Lord. God is looking for a young man that is willing to consecrate his life for the things of the Lord. A young man that is willing to choose the kingdom of God over the culture of this world. Is there a young person here that can say, God, pour it into my life, God. Pour it into my life to such an extent that I can sing and declare, God. Sing it tonight, declare it. Pour it over my family. Come on, sing it loud tonight and say, Pour it over my family. Yes, God, here I am singing tonight. Pour it over my family. Oh, God, pour it out. Pour your hands to the Lord all over the sanctuary. hand of the Lord be upon you as you take your Bible in your hands. I have to 
say a few things. Didn't these praise singers, musicians do a kicking job? God, that's awesome. I, uh, I'm just impressed to no end with the worship. We, we don't have a lot of time for entertainment. We don't have the capacity to be entertainers and anointed at the same time. But I will say this. I think God honors excellence. And these guys did so good. I looked over at my son. Looked over at my son. I said, that girl is a great drummer. Give honor today to Brother Torres and Brother Torres. He, he began to tell me why he wanted this meeting, why he felt like it was so important. And immediately, immediately, my heart uh, felt a connection. I wouldn't give you a nickel for an apostolic preacher that doesn't want to develop some ministries beneath him. And uh, I was so humbled by the invitation. Brother Burnett, I, dude, I'm telling you, my voice is hideous. But it's because I've preached, I think we figured it up on the way here, I think I've preached 15 times in the last 13 days or 14 times in the last 12 days. Then he gets up here with that big, deep voice. I thought, man, I'd trade my right leg for that voice. So if you're in the market for a right leg, I'll trade you. To all the pastors that are in the house, to all the ministries I give you honor, to every young ministry in this place. Please realize in services like this, you are not forgotten. Services like this are designed to make a difference in this world. And it will today because I believe I've heard from God. So I turn your attention to 1 Samuel chapter number 17. I apologize. I apologize that I will not be able to be here tomorrow as originally planned. My very first convert from 33 years ago, I hit the ground trying to win people. And I won he and his wife to the Lord. And, uh, they progressed through the years. He actually is on my board of directors now. He was my head usher for 25 years, which kind of came in handy because he was the chief of police. <laughs> Somebody come in, act a fool. I just kind of said, don't make me sick my usher on you. I have to take care of that funeral tomorrow. I intended to be here. My original intention was to be with my son tomorrow night. He's a lot better preacher than I am. If y'all can endure tonight, y'all going to have some throwdown church tomorrow night. Hidden in the 11 words, 1 Samuel chapter number 17, verse number 56, is a dynamic revelation that somebody in this place needs to see today. The scripture tells us, and the king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. Inquire thou whose son this stripling is. 
my contribution to this kind of meeting that I so cherish and admire you for having, Pastor. My title today is A Place Where Striplings Are Revealed. A Place Where Striplings Are Revealed. You lift your hands and pray one more time before we get into the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I'll start my timer and I'll let you be seated. Obviously, the story from which I've read to you tonight is the story of what most of us would consider the well-worn saga of David and Goliath. One aspect of this story, however, that most people never really take the time to consider is that before they met on the battlefield, there was a stark and absolute difference between David and Goliath until the day they met. The giant Goliath had been boisterously swinging a sword on a battlefield, but David had been silently seeking distant pasture lands to lead his sheep to. We know that the giant Goliath had been roaring in the valley of Elah while David quietly survived in the obscurity of watching sheep graze in the silence. Goliath had been breathing out perpetual threats, but David had been hidden in a perpetual wilderness. Goliath had been challenging God's people for 40 days while David had been wandering all untold days, almost unseen by anybody else. Goliath had openly defiled the armies of the living God, while David softly played his harp in secluded places where no humans could hear his lonely, melodious refrain. Ah, but then came the day that David's daddy called him in. And if you'll allow me to paraphrase it in our vernacular, he calls him in and basically tells David, your brethren are all important warriors and they've got value and significance to the kingdom. You, on the other hand, aren't so terribly important. In fact, you're just a lowly shepherd with seemingly no real significance to the, the present situation of our kingdom for that reason. I need you to take leave of your sheep and take food to your brethren on the battlefield. Now, at least to David, it must have sounded like daddy was saying, your brethren are so significant that they can't go searching for food. And consequently, you, on the other hand, are so insignificant to the present pace of our kingdom that you can leave your menial tasks and deliver food to your brethren. Uh, uh, with a statement like that, there was probably no doubt in David's mind where he seemed to stand in the kingdom. He was a lowly shepherd walking in obscurity, quietly operating in isolated places and perpetually seemingly behind the scenes. And it was into that equation that David's seemingly lonely existence was disrupted one day when uh, 
he was sent to carry corn and bread to his brethren who despite their sterling reputations as mighty warriors were hiding at that very moment on the hillside that led down to the valley of Elah. When David arrived, he found out that for at least the last 40 days, God's people had shrouded themselves in the brushery and the trees of the hillside while the giant stood openly out in that valley spitting out unanswered challenges to those that claimed to be the armies of the Lord. Ah, but David only watched that for a little while. And something began to happen in the spirit of David. Not only was David not recognized as a well-known warrior famous from prior battles, but David appeared to them to be an unknown lad. Nobody recalled him bringing down giants before. Nobody spoke about his past exploits. Nobody had even noticed his existence. Ah, but that day was going to change something in David's life forever. And I speak to this congregation tonight by the authority of the Holy Ghost to tell you some of you are going to be changed tonight and you are never going to be the same again. You are never going to be the same again. <laughs> David was only there to deliver a little bit of food to his brethren, but when he was there, suddenly he found himself drawn to this godless giant roaring in the valley beneath him. In fact, that moment would be such a, a decisive moment that when David started down that hillside towards the giant, the very pages of biblical history opened up to be forever changed. I need you to see what God has dealt with me so strongly about for this service. You see, when I take a fresh look at an old story about David and Goliath, I have to believe that David found his heart driven to a response by three vital elements. David, first of all, quickly identified this giant as an enemy of God. As an enemy of God, somebody has got to stand up and remove that enemy from the equation. Secondly, David understood that if I sit here and do nothing, it's going to validate his mockery and his disrespect towards God's kingdom. Hear me, hear me. Goliath had mocked the armies. Goliath had challenged God's people. Goliath had insulted the elements of the kingdom. And David suddenly felt a responsibility. If I don't do something, it's going to look like we're powerless. It's going to look like he's got God backed in a corner. Finally, something rose up in David. The third thing that happened to him. Something rose up in David that looked at that giant that had his brothers trembling on a hillside hidden behind the shrubbery. But something inside of David said, I refuse 
to be afraid. I refuse to be intimidated by the threats that he hurls my way. Goliath roared at David when he stepped said, I'm going to feed your carcass to the fowl of the air. You know what that was really saying? Goliath was saying, by the time I get done with you, I'm going to cut you in so many tiny pieces that a little bird from the sky will come up and carry your pieces away. But David looked at him and said, I refuse to be intimidated by this godless giant. And all in all, when those three elements were established in David's world, something happened to David's heart that rose up beyond any personal ego. It overcame any fear of humiliation. It banished any concern of being seen as a fool among his brothers. Watch him now. David slips down the hillside uh, that his brothers were hiding on uh, and he met Goliath on the battlefield stopping only long enough to pick up five smooth stones from the brook. Stones that were the perfect size uh, to fit in the sling that David had carried for years in obscurity. You know the story of how David marches up to Goliath and when Goliath raised his sword to strike David down, David slung a smooth stone and as it propelled out of David's sling, it had such a velocity that the Bible said that the stone sunk into his forehead. In our mind's eye, we've heard the story enough uh, that we all have seen it in our mind. Uh, that stone hits him in the forehead, uh, and that giant begins to teeter back and forth until he finally crashes to the ground, uh, and David runs to take Goliath's own sword, uh, and he separated this godless giant giant's head from his convulsing body. We know the story. We've heard the story. And if we're not careful, we say, what else is there in the story that we don't know? Hold on to me. I've come to bring a revelation to some of you preachers in this building today. We've overlooked it through the years. But while all of this was transpiring, King Saul from his tent hidden in obscurity looks down and sees this young man holding the head of a severed head of Goliath in his bloody hands. And he quickly turns to his general, Abner. And he says, Abner, who saw is this youth and Abner said I don't, I, I don't even I ain't got a clue I'm uh, uh, Abner said, O king, my eyesight ain't no better than yours. Uh, but watch now. Uh, when Abner said, I have no idea who this child belongs to, uh, King Saul said, immediately inquire thou whose son uh, the stripling is. Look, look, look at it with me. We've read the story of David and Goliath untold times. We've heard David and Goliath preached in scores of messages. We've told the story of David and Goliath in thousands of Sunday school classes. But the one thing I've never heard anybody deal with was standing there looking had a fallen giant and a child with victory. The king 
Satan said, I want to know who that stripling is. I want to know whose son that stripling is. Y'all better thank God for my suspenders tonight. I have to tighten my belt up. I got a feeling I'm going to preach a little bit here. Listen to me. King Saul said, I want to know whose boy that stripling is. Now, in all 780,137 words of your King James Version of the Bible, this is the only time that the word stripling is ever used. But in this solitary instance of the word, you're going to find the core of the message that God has sent me to preach to you about tonight. We are going to find the core of God's heartbeat for some hungry ministry in this place today. You see, the most common definition of stripling comes from the Hebrew word, ilim. Ilim is generically accepted to mean a young man. But when you turn to the original root word from which stripling is derived, it comes from the word not ilim, but alam. Alam, and when it, while it sounds similar. Alarm means something totally different. Alarm or stripling means uh, they had been veiled out of sight. They had been hidden away. They had been concealed. They had been kept secret. <laughs> stripling means uh, they have yet to be revealed. Are you with me now? Come on now, are you with me? When Saul called David a stripling, what he was saying, Brother Torres, is that potential didn't just show up. It's been inside him hidden for a long time. That strength that boy has is not brand new. It's just been veiled out of sight. The value he has to the kingdom is incredible, but it's been concealed. The power he has over the enemy, that's not a new thing. Thing, but it's been kept secret for years. That kind of anointing has been there for a long time. And he was just waiting to be revealed. Now the world sees something revealed in David that they had never seen before. Now the world suddenly recognizes something dynamic in the ministry of David that God had seen all along in those lonely, isolated, obscure times uh, while David's true potential and ministry seemed hidden from view. Uh, I'm preaching to some precious somebody who feels like you've fallen short of what your spiritual potential really is. Uh, God wants you to listen to me today in this holy house. It was on that day that Stripling's potential was finally revealed for the world to see and God's enemies to fear.
Here, 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 here. When Saul said, where did, where, where, where'd that stripling come from? What he was saying is, oh my word, I didn't realize that he had that kind of anointing. Who knew about this boy and didn't tell us? Who knew about this ministry and didn't tell us what was going on? I need somebody to hear me. Something happened between the time David was a stripling, wandering unseen in obscurity, and the time he walked off that battlefield, dragging Goliath's head. Somewhere between carrying daddy's corn to carrying Goliath's sword, something happened. Something happened. Somewhere between carrying daddy's corn and carrying Goliath's sword, that stripling had something happen to him that caused him to go from a little shepherd boy hiding in the wilderness to being the most sought after preacher among them. Are you listening to me right now? To the ones that God desires to speak to tonight, let me tell you what drives me to your pulpit and why I feel such a kindred spirit, Pastor, because I am convinced, I feel it in my spirit. There's a lot of young ministries that sit in this building before me tonight. Your desire is fervent, but your mind is frustrated. Your intentions are right, but your attitude is restrained. Your faith is unwavering, but your ministry is unfulfilled. Your commitment is sincere, but your response is subdued. I've come to tell you today, you're doing your best to serve God, and you want to be used of him more than anything else. But you said in a service like this vex because your potential is veiled from sight. Your strength is hidden away. Your value is concealed. Your calling is kept secret and your anointing has yet to be revealed. I've come today to preach to the striplings in this building. I've come today to find some of you that say, Brother White, I want to desperately. But it seems like my ministry simply serves God on the backside of a wilderness. Wilderness full of jobs and marriages and careers and struggles and parenting and relationships and church and ministry in a department of, of teaching Bible studies. What God wants you to be has yet to be revealed because you're a stripling hidden behind a wilderness full of things that's hiding your ministry. No, I know exactly where your ministry's at. You sit in every service with a pure heart that longs to be used of God, but you sit in frustrated obscurity because you never know the fulfillment of knowing that you drove back somebody's devil. You prayed healing on somebody hurting. You spoke a supernatural word to a struggling soul. You didn't hold back hell with your faith and you sit there saying someday, someday, someday I want to be used of God. You're a stripling. 
it's there, but it's hidden. It's there, but it's in obscurity. And you're in a position because of a wilderness full of things that have swallowed you up, that have distracted you, that you've failed to become everything God wants you to be. I've come to tell this congregation today, you're never going to feel that fulfillment because you're a stripling that's packed with power that's never yet been revealed. You feel that sense of, of spiritual accomplishment. You never feel that because you're a stripling whose potential has been hidden away and concealed from view. And what happens is in the mind of young ministry, what happens is they resign themselves to accept the fact others are the warriors. I'm just a shepherd. Others stand on battlefields. I only get to stand in obscurity. Others do exploits. I just get to do life. Others are anointed and you're just saved. Ah, oh, but let me give you the key to my heart tonight. Where does that mentality come to an end? Where does that mentality stop? God is no respecter of persons. So what is the difference, my brother, in those who are spiritually effective and those that are seemingly ineffective? I've got news for every stripling in this room tonight. You're just as anointed as any other ministry. It's just hidden out of sight. You've got as much power as Doug White does. It's just hidden by distractions. You've got as much potential as anybody else. It's just yet to be revealed. You're a stripling. Walking around with something inside you. You're walking around with something inside you that's going to shock all your friends. There's something inside of you that's going to make those people that sit in the pew behind you say, my Lord, I didn't know that boy had that in him. I need to ask you a question. Where is that place where striplings are revealed? The fact that some of you sit here with giftings and talents hidden inside of you demands that we find that place where striplings are revealed. Before I tell you where striplings are revealed, let me tell you where striplings are never revealed. <laughs> Stripling called David wasn't revealed when he cut off the head of the giant. It was somewhere before that. That stripling wasn't revealed when he sunk that stone in David's forehead. No, his world changed before that. That stripling named David wasn't revealed when he stopped by to pick up five smooth stones out of the brook. If you want to see where his heart was changed, you got to go back beyond that. If you want to know where his potential finally took shape. Look back at those three elements I told you that happened to him before he ever got to that. Stay with me now. You need to know yeah, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. In fact, I feel the spirit of the prophetic in this house right now. 
you need to know if the stripling you is ever going to be revealed just like David the first thing you've got to do is learn how to identify the enemies of God the stripling started being uncovered in David when he stood in a place of maturity and said that is the enemy of God and I've got to separate myself from that enemy hey young ministry false doctrine is the enemy of God preach truth preach truth preach false doctrine is the enemy of God you gotta preach one God you gotta preach Jesus name baptism you gotta preach receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues Bubba, there's no easier way because there's no other way. If this gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Let me help you. Just in case you're not mature enough to identify the enemies of God. Pride is an enemy of God. You listening to me? I don't care how anointed you think you are. I don't care if you get up every morning and have coffee with Jesus. I'm not impressed if you have angelic visitations three times a night and you pray like a Muslim five times a day, you don't impress me. If you're eat up with pride, we need somebody that'll say there's nothing I wouldn't do. There's nothing I wouldn't sacrifice. Let me give you another one. You won't be used to God. <laughs> Good. Get up and do something for God. But you'll never do anything for God until you develop the ability to identify the enemies of God and isolate them from affecting your world. Uh, carnality is the enemy of God. Doubt is the enemy of God. Compromise is the enemy of God. I don't care who's throwing in the towel. I don't care who's tired of preaching holiness. I don't care who's throwing standards out the window. I don't intend to be carnal. I want to be a stripling that's been revealed. Is there anybody in here that still believes holiness is right? If your ministry is ever going to become Nehesha-Tobo, I'm telling you, the spirit of the prophetic is very close to this church right now. You need to listen to me. If you're ever going to be revealed, 
if the stripling inside of you is ever going to develop into the vibrant God-given ministry God wants you to have, you've got to recognize the enemies of God that hinder your progress. If your hobby is your hindrance, get rid of it. If your boyfriend is your battleground, get rid of him. If your temper is your trap, get over it. If your lust is the leash holding you back, take a cold shower and stay close to God. Forty, almost 41 years gives you a unique perspective about those that can and can't be used of God. I cannot begin to tell you the massive number of people that I've seen set in obscure pews, Brother Bernard. Uh, powerless and pathetic until they realized all oh, that's holding me back is I've got some enemies of God that are stealing my anointing. Uh, you better hear this preacher today. If you're a stripling hidden from the world, you should be doing exploits in. You've got to reach the place that you recognize the enemies of God and isolate their influence in your world. You ready? How long I've been preaching? Who y'all in trouble? My phone went dead. I mean, my watch went. No, it didn't. Here it comes. Some of y'all just about jumped up and shouted right then when I said it wasn't dead. The second thing that propelled David from being a stripling to becoming revealed as a mighty warrior in the kingdom of God is he reached the place that he suddenly felt an overwhelming sense of responsibility that made his heart scream. If I don't do something, it validates hell's mockery in my world. Can I tell you, David would have walked away from that hillside back to an unfulfilled obscurity if something hadn't awakened inside of him and said God's kingdom is going to be disrespected and mocked if I don't step out and take a stand. My brothers and my sisters, there are some of you that have learned how to identify the armies of the enemy but there's others in here you sit back and you say if somebody else does it I'll do it if somebody else shouts I'll shout if you listen to this preacher you gotta feel a sense of responsibility my pastor don't have to tell me to do it I'm gonna praise God I don't, I don't care. Well, Brother White, I'm just quiet by nature. <laughs> this is my, I got one stinking hair in my mouth. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He's a, something else, there's a day I used to tell him. Boy, don't you get it twisted. I'm still your daddy. I can still whip you. Then he became a policeman for 10 years before he became an evangelist. And I used to say, boy, don't you get it. I'm glad you're here, son. <laughs> I would venture to say there's not too many people that would try to get up in my face and give me a hard time if my son is there. You know why? Because he feels a responsibility. That's my 
daddy. That's my world. That's And I don't care how deep that stripling is hidden inside of you. If you'll ever get to the place that you say, I'm not going to sit back and let everybody else worship. I'm not going to sit back and twiddle my thumbs. I'm going to be in the middle of whatever God's doing. I'm going to be in the middle. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Our devil is a liar. Hey, we got this chick in our church. I think it's about a year ago now, year, maybe a year and a half. Got this chick in our church, and, and I'll tell you, she come from a long way. She come from a long way, baby. I mean, she was something else. Drug head extraordinaire. She was involved in every kind of everything happening, coming and going. But God got a hold of her. And we got her in the church. God filled her with the Holy Ghost. And uh, and she, I'm, I'm talking about a chick that was so bad, she would whip guys. Little old chick, this dude would whip the fire out of them. And God's kind of changed her world. She's in the grocery store here a while back, right after, a few months after God saved her. And she keeps hearing us talk about God can do anything. It don't matter what you need God to do. God can do anything. Uh, hey, preachers, you better listen to me. Pastors, you're going to get what you preach. You don't want to preach power, you ain't going to have it. You don't want to preach miracles, you're not going to have them. You don't want to preach healing, you're not going to have them. But Bubba, she walking down aisle of the grocery store and all of a sudden she hears somebody going ah, 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 and just falls out lays on the ground dead as a brick and and people see it and they're all saying call 911 somebody call an ambulance and this dude's laying there there was somebody nearby that checked for a pulse couldn't find a pulse there was no breathing there was nothing there was nothing and all of a sudden while everybody's saying let's call an ambulance let's call this let's call that she looked at everybody nobody was trying to help him and she just come through the crowd with her miscolored hair and everything she still had and she knelt down beside him and said Jesus they said you can do anything I need you to raise him up I need you to heal him and God raised him up God raised him back Hey, stripling, if you want to be used of God, you've got to get an attitude that says, I don't care if everybody else is sitting still. I've got to be used of God. Hey, Brother Stripling. Sister Stripling, you're going to have that unfulfilled existence in the kingdom until you finally escape it. But if you ever escape your unfulfilled existence, it's going to be when you reach the place that you feel a personal responsibility. Nobody got to tell me to lay hands on the sick. No, my pastor don't have to tell me to cast out that devil. (laughs) 
Brother White, I'm just quiet. I'm just reserved. No, you're just a stripling that God could use, that God could anoint, that God could change. Let me shock some of you right now. There's some of you, if you'd only turn and lay your hand on the head of somebody near you, God could heal their body immediately. If you'd only begin to intercede right now, God could deal with your backslid baby right now. If you'd only speak with authority, God could drive your devils back. Let's try it now. Turn and lay your hands on somebody and begin to pray the power of God down in their world. Come on, some of you. You need to speak with authority and drive that demonic influence back. Stop waiting on somebody else. Quit waiting on somebody else to move out. Stop waiting for somebody else to respond. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Come on, how many miracles are lost because you're waiting on somebody else to do it? You're a stripling hidden from sight. You're a stripling veiled from visibility. You're a stripling silently kept secret. Listen. Listen. Shh. Give me your attention. Give me your attention. We're fixing to let this thing go, but I need your attention. The young man that was up here praise singing. Where are you? Tall, slender guy. Where are you at? The Lord's got a word for him. Can he come to me? If he can't, don't worry about it. I want you to listen to me. There's a third thing. Bring him to me. There's a third thing that's got to happen if a stripling is going to be revealed. You love God. You want to be mightily used of God. You desire exploits. But if it's ever going to happen, you've got to identify the enemies of God. Stop him right there. You've got to identify the enemies of God. You've got to feel a responsibility to the kingdom. Son, 
I need you to listen to me. You hear me? He looks, he could be a twin of a man who once upon a time was a preacher, a pastor, could have been anything, but he got a spirit out of sorts and went around the country telling everybody, you look just like him. He told everybody that he was called of God to destroy Doug White's ministry. He was called of God to, de to devastate me. I'm talking about somebody that would call the police and say I was beating my wife and send the police to my house. Me and my wife would be sitting there eating supper. A man that was as corrupt as he could be. But I watched you up. You look just like him. But I watched you up there singing tonight. I said, God, that man looks just like the fellow that hated my guts. And God said, and I tell you in the Holy Ghost, God said to tell you everything that man could have been, everything that man was supposed to accomplish, God's going to let you have every bit of it. If you'll sell out, if you'll commit yourself to God, God's going to let that fall on you. You have no idea what God could do. You have no idea how God can do it. Now, I got to close. I'm, 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 I'm sorry I preached. About 47 minutes, I've got to quit. If you're going to be revealed, the stripling in you is going to come out. The world's going to see what God's placed deep hidden inside of you. You've got to learn how to identify the enemies of God. Then you've got to learn how to feel a responsibility to the kingdom of God. But there's one more thing, Pastor, that David had to do to really be a stripling reveal. He had to refuse to be intimidated by anything. I need you to hear me. Hell will try to intimidate you. Your friends will try to intimidate you. Your family will try to intimidate you. Your emotions will try to intimidate you. But I'm going to tell you what scares hell to death. Give me somebody that refuses to be intimidated and hell trembles. Your friends will know that you're serious about being used of God when you refuse to be intimidated. When it stops your emotions from hindering you, it's when you reach the place. You just refuse to be intimidated. A few months ago, and I close, please stand with me. A few months ago, I was vexed. Brother, I was vexed. It was so bad, I spent an entire Saturday mad. I didn't know who I was mad at. I didn't know what was going on. All I know is I was, I had some more kind of mad happening. Finally, I mean, I was walking into businesses looking for people to lay hands on. I, I, I mean, if there had been a devil anywhere, man, we'd have went to town. We'd have had a, we'd have cast, I'd have cast BLs above out of the devil. Finally, it was so bad that my wife said to me, she said, "Honey, who are you mad at?" I said, "I don't know." But if I could find them, I'd lay. I was so frustrated. I felt like something was challenging my spirit. Finally, about midnight, I told man, I don't go to bed early. About midnight, I told my wife, I said, I, 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 maybe if I go to sleep, it'll go away. So I went to bed. Five o'clock in the morning, my eyes popped open, and God spoke to me and said, Watch. And I will show you a thing. And I watched. And in this vision God began to give me. I could see faces of preachers. That were just 
tell they were worried and they were frustrated and their spirits were overwhelmed and, and on and on. I said, God, what is it? You've got to tell me. And God said, we have now entered into a brand new season and the spirit of intimidation is going to be loosed on my ministers. He said they're going to be challenged from fronts. They never expected to be challenged. There are going to be people that rise up and question their message and question their methods and question their standards. I said, all right, God. He told me, he said, you've got to tell your preachers. I've got 45 men under my ministry. He said, you've got to tell your preachers to be ready. He said, the intimidation will come. But tell them when they come to intimidate you, don't back up. Don't change your attitude. Stand there with a smile on your face. Let me paraphrase that for you. If you're going to succeed, you've got to refuse to be intimidated. God's getting ready to pour it out, son. There's an anointing that's getting ready to be poured out in this congregation. There's some striplings all over this sanctuary. Brother White, I just don't know if I can do it. You ever been there, Bubba? But King Saul said, that dude's a stripling. Somebody tell me who his daddy is. If you ever figure out who our father is. There's not a devil in hell that could scare you anymore. If you ever figure out who our father is, there's not a sickness that would intimidate you ever again. He's in this place. He's in this place. Are you listening to me right now? He's in this place. And if you're in this house and that stripling is hidden in you, make your way to an altar and tell God, help me to identify the enemies of God. Help me to feel a responsibility and help me to never be intimidated. Come on, striplings. That's it. That's it, Bubba. Come on, some of you just found a place where striplings are revealed. help me come on elders help me that's it darling you're a stripling you're a stripling waiting to be revealed
just for you tonight. Just for you tonight. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, what a powerful word. I, I leave impacted with the word. Amen. And uh, take it. Let God do what he is going to do. Amen. You're about to be revealed if you take the steps that Bishop, amen, spoke about tonight. Amen. I submitted myself to Bishop. I said, Bishop, we could do this or we don't have to do this. I have learned to, I'm the pastor of this church, but I've learned to submit to the man of God when he comes to this sacred desk. And I trust Brother Bishop, Doug White. I said, but we don't have to do this if you feel we can. And he says, yes, he feels that it's something that we ought to do. And because this conference is in part, we want to impart something to, to you this evening. We wanted to give you something and let it represent an impartation, amen, from seasoned ministers, established ministers, amen, mentors of great men of God. And let us impart into your life, into your ministry. So we are going to do this impartation. I'm going to ask for the pastors in this house to please come and stand. Los pastores, por favor, si usted puede venir y pararse aquí enfrente con nosotros. Amen. If you are a pastor in this house, we want you to come, please. Si usted es pastor en esta casa, venga. Por favor, yo sé que hay algunos otros aquí. Amen. Y lo invito que pase, por favor. First of all, the pastors, amen, to be here. Un aplauso a los pastores, hermanos, amén. Dios los bendiga. Gracias por llevar esta conferencia. Amén. Praise God. Hermano Pérez, Dios los bendiga, varón de Dios. Gracias, pastor. Amén. Brother Joel, God bless you. Thank you for coming and supporting our event. Amén. Amén. First of all, there's probably about 140 vials of oil so this is not for everybody okay first of those first of all for those that are in active ministry primeramente para aquellos que están en ministerios activos okay you're a young minister a young deacon a young MIT a sister amen that you serve at your local church alongside your pastor amen you are in leadership in your church we want you to come going to get in line, Brother, uh, Brother White, Bishop is going to impart a word, amen, to each and every one of you, and you're going to come, and these men are going to pray for you, and you're going to be giving an impartation, a vial of oil, amen, to it bless your ministry, and you're going to take this, you're going to remember the word of God that has been imparted to your life tonight, in Jesus' name, okay. Amen. So those that are in active ministry, you are a musician, you are a singer, you are a Sunday school teacher. Amen. You serve in some capacity. Amen. In your church, we'd like for you to come. Amen. Uh, if you aspire ministry, your time will come. Okay. I'm going to ask you to hold off so that we could have enough. Amen. For those that are in active ministry. Si usted está en un ministerio activo. Queremos que usted pase por la línea. Estos pastores van a orar por usted. El hermano va a dar una impartición de una palabra para su vida, para su ministerio. Si usted está en ministerio activo, amen, ministerio joven, usted está invitado para pasar por esta línea. So if you're in young ministry, you're just starting off. If you're a seasoned minister, amen, let's make room for the new army that God is raising up, amen, to come and get their impartation, amen, amen, so if you're in active ministry, would you please stand up, a young active ministry, please stand up, amen, you are active ministry, look how beautiful this is, my goodness, thank you for honoring God 
coming to this conference and receive what he had ready for you in Jesus' name. Voy a pedir que el ministerio local, the local ministry, we can get on this side. Amen. And Brother Burnett, as uh, they come through the line, you can hand them the oil and they'll walk through the line of pastors and then ministers on this side. Yes. If you, Brother Joel, if you look, turn that way, that way they can come down that aisle. Right there. Yes, sir. Right there is fine. Amen. Step up, hermano Perez, aquí en frente. Por favor, junto hermano Burnett. And then you gentlemen curve that way so they can go out that aisle so if you're going to come up all of you that are standing you're going to come up this side let ministry pray for you they will hand you the oil ministry will continue to pray for you and you can go out amen back to your seat through this aisle amen how many receive this ready to receive this impartation in Jesus name how many are ready to be revealed how many are ready to be revealed hallelujah hallelujah would you worship God right now as Bishop comes one more time to impart a word of the Lord in your ministry in Jesus' name, Bishop. Thank you so much. God bless you. I am a great, great believer in the spirit of impartation. Having said that, there are literally scores of examples and types and shadows of impartation, not the least in my opinion, not the least of which is when Jesus found out they had seven loaves and two fishes, and Jesus said, don't send them away, set them down. And the master took a supernatural thing and put it in the hands of his 12 apostles. God imparted to his apostles to give to the people. One of the things that I've noticed about real apostolic impartation there's a lot of things that transpire that we call impartation that is not impartation. But probably the truest sense of impartation is that God, through the ministry, the elders, imparts from them into you so that you can go to your world and give them what God's going to put in your hands tonight. Now, there's not one doubt in my mind that not everybody that's going to come to this altar tonight and get a vial of this oil is going to honestly get an impartation, but it will not be because of these preachers, will not be because of pastor, will not be because of me. Because as much as we want to offer that, as much as we want to hand you the impartation, impartation doesn't work for people that really don't value it. I've noticed a few things about people that it does work for. Every true impartation, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or whether it's imparting to a crowd this size, every real impartation that I have ever been a part of most of the time I'm weak for days because God pulls out of the spirit of these ministers. But I can tell you the ones that it works on. It works on the ones that suddenly get out there and do what I preach tonight 
and realize, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I could feel this. Those that impartation truly works on are those that will say, if God puts it in my hands, I'm going to operate in this dimension tonight. Whether you know it or not, God's going to impart from this ministry into your heart. You are the ones that have to operate in that ministry. And now, by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God, from the heart of my ministry, the heart of these other ministries, open up something, God, in our spirit. What you've invested in us, God, now we're going to invest it in them. God, let there be a supernatural coming together, God, of the elder and those that are aspiring to get into this thing. God, I speak impartation to every living soul that's in this building. Take anointing from us. Put it in them, Jesus. Put passion in them, God. Take healing from us. Put it in them. In Jesus' name. Take authority over demonic spirits and put it in them. Now, by the spirit of impartation, I speak it in Jesus' name. 